It looks like we're live now. Just wait a few, a couple of minutes just for people to join. Um, so yeah, at the moment we're live on a few different platforms. How are you both doing today? Good, thank you. <laughs> Apart from a slightly squeaky voice, apologies. <laughs> I've got kind of my allergies starting, so I might, um, have the odd sneeze here or there. <laughs> um, okay, I think we'll begin. So um, my name's Anita. Um, I've been at NRAS since 2019. Um, people might recognise me from a few things I've kind of worked on before. Um, I have RA myself, so I was diagnosed around nine years ago. Um, and throughout my RA journey, I've had kind of various struggles with mental health and well-being. Um, so this is a topic that I feel quite strongly about. Uh, so, yeah, really happy to be hosting this NRAS Live um, and yeah, today I'm joined by two wonderful guests. We've got uh, Dr. Emma Dewars and Sarah Collins. Um, so firstly, Emma, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of give a brief introduction about what you'll be talking about today? Great, thank you. Yes, so um, I'm a chartered psychologist and associate professor in rheumatology and self-management. I work for the University of the West of England in Bristol, and my primary role is research. And today I'm going to be talking about mental health and inflammatory arthritis, sort of from the evidence perspective, so, so what we know so far. Okay, great. Thank you, Emma. Um, and Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself and maybe yeah, talk about some of the... I, yeah. I've been um, working as a counsellor and therapist for uh, 25 years now. Um, but I've had uh, RA for 42 years and um, recently retired from working as a, as a counsellor and therapist in private practice. Emma and I have come across each other on the circuit from time to time and we've kind of been converging on the same point, haven't we, Emma? But Emma has more clout because she's who she is. I'm working at the coalface um, with the more practical side of things, but I'm hoping to... Um, do a, a meander through the psychological uh, challenges of living with RA. Um, I'm not going to be talking about JIA, I'm afraid, purely because I think that it's uh, it's too big a subject and the challenges that face young people deserve a webinar of their own. Um, and I think it will just get very confusing. But a lot of what I talk about will help people who have children with JIA and just to understand the emotional experiences that adults face, some of which children face, but it is a much more complex psychological problem for children. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so now people that regularly kind of watch our live streams might have noticed that we're a week early. We usually uh, stream these the last Wednesday um, of the month, um, but there is a reason why we've moved it. Um, so next week is the BSR conference, so that's the annual conference for the British Society of Rheumatology, um, which a lot of rheumatology professionals attend. Um, NRAS will actually be there as well, and Emma, you're actually there as well. Uh, so yeah, we're happy that you're able to join us kind of um, for this NRAS Live and I believe you'll be doing a talk as well so um, we're quite lucky today because I think we might get a little preview of that. <laughs> yep there's certainly overlap and probably the main difference so at the BSR conference I have a slightly longer time but also I'm going to be thinking um, talking about a study we did with health professionals which I haven't included in today's talk because I wanted the focus to be on, on people living with a rheumatic condition but it was just to understand more um, about the confidence and the skills that they have in relation to supporting people's mental health so happy to update anyone on that if they're interested sounds great okay um, so let's get your presentation up and you can kind of start going through that great shall I get going yep Great. So thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to come here today and to talk about mental health and inflammatory arthritis. Let me just check. Uh, how do I move my slides along? 
Oh, yeah. So I think, I mean, it is now increasingly recognised that there is going to be no health without mental health and that people whose primary diagnosis is a long-term physical health condition can experience high levels of psychological distress. And the NHS has categorised psychological distress in physical health conditions into five levels. So at level one, we see general difficulties coping with the illness and the perceived consequences of this for someone's lifestyle and their relationships. And these are defined as problems that are um, at a level that is common to many, possibly even most people receiving a diagnosis. At level two, there are more severe difficulties with coping, causing significant anxiety. And this goes up to level five, which we would describe as severe and enduring and complex mental health disorders. A couple of things to say about this. The first is that a person can have needs at several levels simultaneously. For example, someone with severe mental illness at level five may still have anxiety at level one about an aspect of managing their rheumatic condition. And the other thing is that people can move up and down the levels of need over time. So this might be due to changes in their physical health or their mental health or because of something that's happening in their lives more generally. And the idea is that these level one support needs can be addressed by more or less all health professionals. Level two support needs can be addressed by health professionals who are not necessarily psychologists, but who've probably had some psychology training to work in a sort of psychologically informed way. And then needs at levels three through to five are more likely to be met by psychology or psychiatry professionals. There is a well-established body of evidence about mental health in rheumatology. We see that negative states that might not reach clinical cutoffs or have a, an official diagnosis, but still have an impact. Things such as low mood, sorrow, insomnia, irritability and worry are thought to affect up to 65% of people with rheumatic conditions. And the prevalence of major depressive disorder is estimated around 16.8%. If we look at data that was collected in a national audit from across the country, it showed that 49% of people with confirmed early arthritis met the criteria for low mood or anxiety at that point of diagnosis. When those people were followed up 12 months later, this figure was still high at 25%. So we're talking about something that's very, very usual. There's a really long list of negative associations of poor mental health on a range of outcomes. So this list that I've got here is by no means exhaustive, but it includes decreased function, uh, achieving less benefit from treatments, both drug treatments and non-drug treatments, um, productivity loss at work, and things like isolation and loneliness. Um, I'm just going to very briefly uh, mention juvenile idiopathic arthritis or JIA. Um, it's not an area that I have a great deal of expertise on. Um, and as Sarah said, it's certainly something that um, merits deep exploration in its own right. Um, but if we look in terms of the research, many of the issues that impact adults also impact children and young people with JIA. So approximately a quarter of children with JIA experience symptoms of anxiety and depression. There's also work suggesting that, um, this is from a systematic literature review, that family members of patients with JIA can experience anxiety and depression themselves, which can then impact their child's mental health uh, and pain levels, uh, and thus setting up what can potentially be a sort of cycle. Um, and there's also been a cohort study in Finland, Finland that showed that reduced participation in children and young people was associated with um, worse disability, uh, worse physical functioning and social functioning and lower self-esteem, as you might expect. So I think really that's just to flag up the sort of uh, looking at these things at the level of the family as a whole. 
If we look at support in practice, um, a recent report by the British Society of Rheumatology found that only 39% of rheumatology services in England and World, Wales had psychology available in their department. And um, NRAS's study, which was a national study, themselves found that two in five patients were never asked about their emotional or psychological well-being, and that half of patients with clinical levels of distress did not receive emotional support. So we can already see a huge mismatch mismatch between the levels of um, distress and the resources available to support people. We also see from across the healthcare system that patients who are psychologically and socially vulnerable often report very high levels of worry and anxiety about their health. So I think this audit data and the NRAS survey data highlights the lack of psychologists and the lack of psychological skills in rheumatology teams. And this is really just to say that this does risk patients who have psychological distress living with the consequences of unmet needs. Thinking about models of care, we can see that the relationship between physical health and mental health is complex, it's symbiotic, it works in both directions, and it's really difficult to unpack. But we see that despite this, care tends to focus primarily on physical health from within a medical rather than a biopsychosocial model. So one approach that's being increasingly talked about is called psychologically informed healthcare. And this refers to the idea of integrating psychological principles into general interactions with healthcare professionals. So this um, psychological support can either be direct, so that's psychologists assessing and working with patients, or indirect, which is psychologists working through other health professionals, and in fact also supporting those health professionals. Currently, there are trials of psychologically informed healthcare in cardiology and in oncology, and in terms of the physiotherapy curriculum and in uh, um, acute mental health. And this is certainly an area where I think rheumatology could benefit hugely. This idea of psychologically informed healthcare was echoed in recent patient and public involvement groups that we held specifically to talk about mental health. So we had three online groups and 22 patients joined us. Some of the points that they made included the huge value of being asked about their mental health and just the normalization of difficulties uh, within routine consultations and by members of the rheumatology team. They said that they wanted to explore their fears and anxieties around having their rheumatic condition, but they also wanted to promote living well um, and, and have this sort of constructive uh, aspect to the consultation. They emphasise that mental health and well-being are dynamic, how important it is to consider contextual factors and the very detrimental impact if they experienced healthcare as depersonalized and that really increased people's feelings of stress and anxiety. Ooh, I see that it's done something to my why, the role of the rheumatology team. Um, so we have to recognize that not every health professional can address psychological distress in their clinic, especially when they have limited time and they may feel they're not equipped or, or skilled to do so. However, they can partner with patients to detect and identify mental health problems and then to try and connect to the resources available. And there are several reasons why the role of the team is so important. One of them is that the rheumatology team often have access to their patients and they have these long-term relationships. Another one is that psychological distress can impact physical functioning and pain processing and other aspects of health that the rheumatology team are treating. Uh, another point is that psychological support is a patient priority and patients have said in various surveys and various pieces of work that they really want to work with the rheumatology team to address mental health challenges. And again, both patients and health professionals have said that they would like mental health assessment or measurement to be part of routine care, again feeding into this idea of normalisation. 
If we look at the research evidence from systematic reviews, so the sort of pu the published written papers and randomized controlled trials about what can help with mental health and psychological distress, we see that cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, and interventions that use self-regulation techniques, such as action planning and goal setting, can all be effective. That's where the evidence is. That doesn't mean other approaches aren't effective, just maybe they haven't been studied in as much depth. We've tended to focus on in-person interventions, and these can certainly be helpful when we have the resources to deliver them in practice. However, access to this kind of support is a major challenge for lots of rheumatology teams. So we're at a point now where we need to think about using online therapeutic programs. Um, and the good news is that there is some evidence of equivalency between internet and face-to-face -face delivery, which is helpful. And we might also need to think about whether there is a role for non-therapist assisted internet based cognitive behavioral support, such as things like the worry and sadness program, which targets anxiety and depression. And this would be again at that lower level one or possibly level two of the distress pyramid. And another potential way to increase access is through apps such as Rumor Buddy, although we are mindful of digital exclusion. When a health professional feels that someone's mental health difficulties require additional or specialist support that they cannot provide, there's a huge value again in signposting both within health services, but also via charities and patient organisations such as NRAS. And now in many parts of the UK, we have social prescribers who provide access to a range of services. And I think the great thing about social prescribing is that it recognises um, it, that issues such as social connectedness are really important and also the wider determinants of health. So things like housing and finances can all contribute to mental health and well-being. And my final slide, um, I want to mention the mental health impact in, uh, in the context of COVID. So there is evidence from around the world that COVID did not affect everyone equally and that many people with rheumatic conditions have borne a heavy burden. We've seen significant increases in the prevalence of depression and anxiety and trauma and stress related disorders. And this is likely to be influenced by the compound stressors of increased risk of infection, physical isolation, and patients having to manage their rheumatic condition with limited access to healthcare compared to before. Shielding also had a huge impact on patients' mental health, and it really reinforces the importance of social connectedness for mental well-being. Um, and this is echoed in a recent qualitative study that we did with patients in the Southwest, which found some people felt their mental health really it had deteriorated over the last three years, but it wasn't really recovering well. Um, so just my final point is that this really highlights the importance of health professionals asking people how the pandemic has affected them and how they might support their physical and mental recovery. So that's all from me. And I'm going to hand you um, over now to Sarah Collins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. Um, wow, that's really such important research. Um, I hope it'll really generate even more interest in this very important area of emotional health, um, not only in academia, but also translated into healthcare. Um, body and mind have been treated as separate for so long, too long, uh, but now there's evidence that stress affects the immune system, so that's a big help. Anyway, a big thank you to you and your team for coming up with all of that. Um, I mentioned earlier that for 25 years I've been working with clients experiencing emotional distress, so I'm no stranger to the anguish and life-limiting effects of chronic illness, both personally and professionally. Um, just a quick look at how I got involved with NRAS and what it's led to. Um, I first met Elsa Bosworth at a conference in North Carolina in 2012, and there was a tornado warning at the time. Um, but I, you know, obviously the real world was, was Elsa, who as most of you know, is the founder and former chief executive of NRAS. So as we kept an eye on the sky, we discovered that we had something in common to, um, in addition to RA. We'd both been thinking about mental health services issues and the lack of a publication affecting, addressing, sorry, the emotional effects of RA. So as ever, um, NRAS was well ahead of the curve. 
Elsa asked me if I'd write something and that led to Anne Mass publishing Emotions, Relationships and Sexuality all that way back in 2013. And um, obviously researching for it, we held focus groups. We heard back from over 1,200 people in the first 24 hours um, to our online survey. And I think that made it crystal clear that the psychological distress which accompanies RA is for many the greater challenge. You know, grappling with emotional and physical pain is not something most of us are prepared for. It can change our relationship with ourselves, our nearest and dearest, work colleagues, and even strangers who don't understand about invisible illnesses and their impact. So it can be hard also to accept that our condition is incurable and that remission is the goal. That can feel a very long way off until you're stable on a drug that's right for you. Mercifully, there are many more effective treatments nowadays. So how people respond to diagnosis and living with an illness is very much predicated by their resilience, a characteristic we develop in childhood and by overcoming challenges, manageable challenges, as we mature. In childhood, we also develop the ability to form attachments, affectional bonds. It matters how much, um, how well we've been parented and how secure we felt. Unfortunately, for those who lack security, you know, you're not doomed. It is possible to have reparative relationships, which, as the word suggests, can repair that lack and help us develop resilience in later life. You might have heard about the Harvard study of development, I'm sure Emma will have done in America. It's um, on, an ongoing study into what brings people the greatest happiness in life. Since 1938, what's that, 85 years, they've followed two generations of several families in search of an answer. I don't know how many of the study subjects were living with a chronic illness, but in such a large study, it seems likely that a proportion would have been. The findings to date, show beyond doubt that the single most important factor in achieving contentment is our relationships with other people. Good relationships keep us healthier and happier. Not money, not fame, not even success. It's loving and being loved, caring and being cared for. If you're fortunate and enjoy a loving and caring relationship, your chances of happiness should, according to the Harvard study findings, be assured. But what if you don't? While you're having to cope with RA, those closest to you might be loving and caring, but they might also lack empathy and be intolerant. They might not want to share the ups and downs you experience, physically or mentally. So inevitably, there are tensions that change the dynamics of the relationship. And that's when psychological support can be so essential. It's why we need the powers that be to evaluate Emma's research and push for greater provision of talking therapies and social prescribing and the other things that Emma's told us about. Now, I would say this, wouldn't I? But a supportive and objective counsellor provides a safe space in which to defuse and explore difficulties. The therapeutic relationship between client and counsellor has actually been shown to improve physical as well as mental health which is why it would be so valuable for us to have access to a designated health professional, preferably not a robot, who is non-judgmental, accepting of our lived experience and trained to have sensitive conversations with us. I've worked with hundreds of people over two decades and I've rarely encountered anyone who didn't feel better for having been understood, listened to and believed when you're grappling with change, pain and fatigue, it's all too easy to slip into low mood and potentially depression. To have access to a health professional who had time to listen, to normalise what you're experiencing, who could offer hope by discussing effective management of your RA, wouldn't that make such a difference? There definitely wouldn't be as many questions as MS has received today. And that would make a huge difference if you don't have anybody else to confide in as well. So what I'm describing here is the value of a containing relationship, a professional attachment by which you feel held. This person need not be an accredited counsellor, as Emma suggested, but an allied health professional could be trained to provide that type of service. 
And that actually did happen back in 2008 when the NHS um, started something called the IAP program, which um, meant improving access to psychological therapies. And they gave allied health professionals already on the NHS payroll a six weeks training in um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And uh, that, that would be Emma's level two on her slide. And I remember being quite cross about it, having trained for years and years and years to find that somebody was going to be shipped in after six weeks. But they did do some good work. So we're hoping that Emma's research can help something like that become a reality. But what are the obstacles? There are going to be some obstacles. So as a result of the research for the NMAS book I mentioned, it soon became clear that there was a real need for a training for health professionals. So I was asked to devise a workshop room to talk, which Claire Jacklin and I took nationwide to prepare clinicians to have sensitive conversations with patients. What quickly became apparent was how ill-equipped most of the attendees felt. Understandably, they worried that if they helped a patient open up, they might unleash emotions they didn't have the skills to cope with, with nobody to refer on to. There were simply too few rheumatologists, sorry, rheumatology units with a psychologist attached, as Emma's research indicated, 39%. Um, other barriers we heard about during the Room to Talk workshops were a lack of time and privacy for sensitive conversations and health professionals not being given time off work to attend our training in the first place. Nonetheless, at the end of each workshop, anonymised feedback was really positive. Participants had had the opportunity to consider their own feelings, to examine any resistances that prevented them from asking a patient how they were managing. They were given opportunities to explore how it would feel to ask a question of a patient, one that they thought might be inappropriate or too invasive. But in role play, they realised that they could do it. The world didn't end. And furthermore, it was likely to be well received. And many of them were keen to put the training into practice. We know, and we've known for such a long time, that anxiety increases the production of cytokines probably other things as well, but I'm not medically trained. They cause inflammation in the body. And we know that being in the presence of someone we love increases production of oxytocin, the feel good hormone. The Harvard study found that holding a loved one's hand for half an hour is as effective as a mild sedative. Mind and body are inextricably linked through brain chemistry. So I strongly believe that having access to mental health resources as part of treatment will be hugely beneficial and improve patients' lives. It's likely to improve health outcomes too. If you're struggling now with your RA, but you don't have access to psychotherapeutic help, I've prepared some um, emotional first aid strategies which could help you. A glance at Dr. Google, of course, will provide you with all sorts of information but I'm going to share what we'll, we'd be covering if you were my client. And Anita's kindly agreed to make it available on request. So don't underestimate the importance of sleep, but equally don't get too hung up about it. Sleep will follow when your mind is at peace and your pain is under control. Sleep diaries have their uses, but in my experience, they can focus people on it too much. If you can't sleep, don't stay in bed for longer than 20 minutes. Bed must only be associated with sleep and sex. Get up and do something soothing. Definitely no screens. Serotonin, you'll have heard about. It's a neurotransmitter that mediates satisfaction, happiness and optimism. You can increase your serotonin production by eating foods which contain tryptophan. Tryptophan is found in avocados, turkey, brown rice, bananas, milk, salmon, pumpkin seeds and cheese, amongst many other foods. Avoid caffeine and aerobic exercise for several hours before bedtime. Aerobic exercise is anything cardiovascular, of course. Identify a person you can trust to listen, probably a friend rather than a family member, as you talk about your feelings without trying to find you solutions. You know that feeling when somebody says, how are you? And then instantly it's, have you tried this? And have you tried that? And you just think, you asked a question. Do you want to know the answer? Let me speak. 
whatever you feel is normal. It's coping with a chronic debilitating condition, which is abnormal. Don't let anybody imply that there's a right or a wrong way to experience RA. You'll find your own way. Alternatively, contact the NRS, NRS helpline. Anita's going to put this number on our screens, 0800 98 7650. NRAS's experienced staff are specially trained to take your call. They can't give medical advice, but they're extremely well informed, genuinely empathic people who care very much about anyone suffering with RA and JIA. And there's Health Unlocked too, a platform where you'll find a caring RA community ready to share knowledge and experiences or to simply say hi to at three in the morning. Try keeping a journal. I know that might sound a bit sort of trite, but it has been found to be quite um, beneficial. You could write to yourself recording your feelings and hopes and fears. You could put your negative thoughts on one page and try to counteract, counteract them with positive thoughts on the opposite page. And hopefully you'll reread it in the future and see how life has improved for you. But don't write for longer than 15 minutes a day because that's been shown to create too much introspection. Don't suffer in silence. Remind yourself that the cause of your low mood might be fatigue and pain, and this can be managed in conjunction with your rheumatology team. If you can't get through to them, keep trying. Leave messages on the helpline if there is one. Email your consultant secretary. Ask your GP to contact them on your behalf. Leave them in no doubt that your disease activity is not controlled and you need help. But don't tell them I said so. So it is normal to experience low mood. Don't get frightened that you're going to be sucked into depression. Take some time to consider whether there's anything specific and achievable you could change in your life that would make a difference, however small. It will strengthen you to take control and make adaptations. Hold on to the prospect of remission. Rest and pace yourself. I hate giving into it too, but it works. Get out into nature, even if that's driving somewhere and sitting with the window down. Try to stay in touch with friends to avoid becoming lonely and isolated. Friends may be acutely aware of their own good health and sad for you, embarrassed, so they can retreat. Tackle that possibility with them and find activities you can still join in with. There'll be something. Loneliness has been found to increase pain and depress the immune system. And when we're anxious, we tend towards shallow, rapid breathing. This increases the amount of oxygen in our bloodstream and causes us to feel jittery. Now you can correct this by breathing in through your nose as you count to seven and exhaling slowly through your mouth while you count to 11 or as far as you can. Repeat the exercise until you feel calmer. Or you could breathe in and out of a paper bag for a few minutes please make sure it's paper, so that you take in carbon dioxide to offset the effects of too much oxygen. If you have heart and lung problems, please check these techniques out first with your GP. Not knowing what you're dealing with can be stressful and information is empowering. Discover NRAS's Smile RA free e-learning modules. These are self-management short courses online to help you learn more about life with RA and they cover topics such as being diagnosed, meeting your rheumatology team, how to get the best from your consultation, managing pain and flares, and soon there's an excellent module on exercise. And more are on the way. They'll help you understand your RA, they'll equip you with evidence-based information and advice and demonstrate that you're not alone. Your experiences are being shared and understood by thousands of people living now satisfying and fruitful lives despite RA. If all else fails, that you can always turn to the Samaritans 24-7, 365 days of the year. You don't have to be suicidal. And look out for the second edition of the Emotions, Relationships and Sexuality book, now renamed Relationships Matter. Sadly, I don't know you. Um, so I can't predict what will be beneficial to you, but I really hope that some or all of those tips 
will strike a chord and be helpful. Anita. Thank you so much. That was um, that was amazing. Very, very good tips. Um, a few things I've recognised that I've been doing wrong as well, um, especially when it comes to kind of sleep and anxiety, like you said, not to, if you haven't fallen asleep in, is it 15, 20 minutes to get up and do something that calms you. So yeah, some very practical tips. Um, and thank you for putting together that document as well. If anyone would like us to email them a copy, just um, uh, just let us know in the comments and then we can get in touch with you and send that over. Um, don't put your email address in the comments, uh, that's your personal information, but just let us know and we'll get in touch and get that sent over to you. Um, but yes, um, very great talks from both of you. Um, it's really interesting, Emma, to see kind of how, uh, like the lack of psychological help within the rheumatology units, that really shocked me. Um, I personally had experience, um, well, last year was very, very um, negative in terms of uh, kind of mental health for me personally. And I approached my rheumatologist and asked if there was any help and he said no and you know um, a lot of people in the comments have also been saying that mm. they've never been asked about their mental health um, and that's really difficult. Um, can you see that kind of changing anytime? So I think yeah I think that there's there's a lot going on I think historically we've as just as Sarah said we've separated out physical and mental and they're not separate. Um, when we did our study with health professionals I, there was a gap. So a lot of people recognize the importance of mental health, but they didn't feel equipped. A bit like Sarah said, um, people felt, you know, my expertise is around the drugs or my expertise is, you know, um, an ele element of physical activity. So there was something about, you know, that's why I think this idea of psychologically informed care, the role of the psychologist might be to support the nurse, the occupational therapist, the physiotherapist, to have some of those conversations. Um, it was really interesting. We've done some training, uh, uh, much like Sarah, and one of the things that came out was how beneficial it is if non-psychologists, they do want to provide this mental health support, but clinical supervision for them really helps yeah. them grow in confidence and really makes a difference because they want to come away and say, did I, did I do the best thing there? You know, they just... Um, it's an area of concern, just as, as Sarah said. So I, I do, I think it's acknowledged. I think the fact that, for example, they collect this data in the audit signifies they know that this is a problem. And then, and, you know, measuring doesn't necessarily make a huge difference, but it, it, it is important in, as, a, as a part of acknowledging that this matters. And we're measuring it because we want to see it improve. So I hope so. That's a very long-winded answer. <laughs> um, but it's certainly an area that we want to do more work in and, and, and think about. Yeah. And being very great. flexible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great to see that there is kind of more and more research on it. It's, it's very hopeful, you know, as we've seen kind of medication side of, um, you know, rheumatoid arthritis improve, hopefully kind of, other areas as well um you know we'll kind of see that in the future but and i guess another thing before we this um before the this webinar started we were talking a little bit and there'll be huge regional variations but in some areas people may be able to self-refer into therapy therapy services so that's something that may be available. And as we mentioned, things like social prescription or social prescribers. So I think if people are really struggling as Google what help is available in your area um, mm. because it will vary. Yes, I know there's struggles with like wait, waiting lists for, you know, talking therapies and healthy minds. Um, yeah. I've personally had to get, uh, I, I tried, um, uh, I, I had to pay for therapy. Um, yeah, and, you know, I found that to be very, very helpful. Um, but I, I understand, obviously, some people can't do that. Um, but also what you were talking about, Sarah, just, you know, having a loved one there with you and, you know, the research shows that that can massively help. Um, I guess that's what was so difficult about COVID because, 
you know, some people were so isolated and they didn't have that. Um, so, yeah, uh, and what you said as well, Emma, that, uh, you know, the uh, people in the vulnerable category kind of suffered quite a lot, didn't mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. Hugely. And people reflected that until that term, clinically extremely vulnerable was used, the first time people had heard of it, they might not even have seen themselves in that way. That was a real, that was a real challenge to suddenly kind of, yeah, have that. Mm. And I know some people are still shielding, which is, mm. you know, um, crazy. Sarah, you're mentioning, you know, a few people who are still shielding. Yeah. What was kind of your personal uh, experience, Sarah, of kind of the pandemic? And, you know, I'd quite, be quite interested in finding how, how we felt. I think I felt cross, actually. I felt I was being deprived of liberties, but then... I've, um, you know, I also had to accept that I was immunosuppressed and I felt a real responsibility to people in my own situation. Um, I armed myself with information. I think that was what I could do. But yeah, I mean, the tedium of just waiting for life to get back to normal. And I mean, you talk about disempowerment, how disempowering is it to be disempowered by the government? So um, there was a lot of help, certainly in this, in my area in Gloucestershire, um, people helping one another in small communities. And yeah, absolutely feeds into that thing about humans need humans. Definitely. And um, so we have had quite a few questions in, so I think let's uh, move on to those. Um, there were kind of a couple of common themes as well. So we have kind of grouped them together. Um, so the first kind of three questions are quite similar. Um, first of all, we've got, what can you do to try and come to terms with the tremendous sense of loss you feel over all the things you can no longer do? Um, and then someone else asked, how do you manage disappointment when you have to miss out on things? Um, and then someone else put in, mobility. their mobility has declined, so they're home a lot. Um, again, kind of very isolated. How can they come to some acceptance that they're not able to do so much, never mind the fatigue as well? Um, and this person has had RA for 30 years. Well, shall I have a go at that, Emma? Um, from my point of view, I think the most important thing to do to, is, is to allow yourself to, to grieve because it is a loss. It's a huge thing to factor into life. Um, there will be things that you can look forward to potentially in the future, but you have to find them. Um, don't give up on regaining what you've lost. You might suddenly find yourself on a, a biologic or a jack inhibitor that, you know, as it did me, revolutionizes life. Um, I think we need to understand what this word acceptance means because it doesn't mean that you're resigned to it, that, you know, it's fine. On the contrary, it just means you acknowledge what's going on. And once you acknowledge it, then you can find ways to tackle it. But you do, you know, it's okay to be sad. It's inevitable to be sad. Um, and the lady or man whose mobility has declined and is at home a lot now, I mean, that really is tough because it sounds like after 40 years, or 30 years, um, you know, the good drug came along too late for you. Um, so, you know, your mobility has declined. You must have a lot of bone damage. Um, the answer really remains the same. Allow yourself to feel those feelings. Allow yourself to grieve. Share that with somebody if you can, somebody you can trust. And be kind to yourself. Just be kind to yourself. It's Is never there... an answer, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, no, that's some, something I certainly um, kind of went through a period of grief. Um, so I was diagnosed when I was 21. So just, you know, graduated from university, ready to kind of start my career. I wanted to live in London. And then suddenly this thing happened to me and everything changed. Um, and it took quite a lot, a long time to get over um and accept, as you said, um, and acknowledge what uh, how my life has changed. Um, and yeah, there are still moments that, you know, you obviously have shaky moments where you still question um, why, why you've got RA or why has this happened mm. to you, but um, it is definitely a process. 
And I know, Sarah, you got diagnosed quite young as well. I was 24, yeah, so 42 years of it. I'm still learning, and I cope with it well some days, and other days I really don't at all. Um, that's the truth of it. Do you remember grieving, Anita? Did you allow yourself to feel sad and angry? Yes, and I think that I, that happened actually only two years ago, Um where I kind of started the process and then last year where um, there were a lot of stresses in my life last year um, and I kind of didn't talk about it at all I just kind of handled things and made myself busy and just got on with life and then it kind of built up and built up and then it obviously affected my RA because we know that stress can massively um, impact flares and yeah it, I found that you know finally going to therapy, talking about it, and even just being open with my partner and my family, um, I think that massively helped because before that I would just not talk about anything. I would just get on with things. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's very difficult. And when I were talking earlier, it, you know, it does seem that this particular, our, our patient group, as it were, are very stoical I don't know whether that's um, something that's common to other diseases, other conditions, but, um, you know, in the beginning, I think we just feel, well, okay, you've got to get on, there's no choice. But at some point, it catches up with you and you just need to allow it. You'll yeah, and also, faster if you do. Yeah, also, I think the invisible aspect of RA is um, contributes to that a lot because a lot of the time, you know, your family members, your colleagues can't see what you're going through. Mm -hmm. So if you're naturally not very open about it, it can be very difficult to kind of share things. And I don't know, I'm quite um, a reserved person. So I just I keep things in naturally and get on with things. Um, so, yeah, that's that I would encourage people to kind of talk, talk to a loved one. And as you said, Sarah, someone that you trust, it can be a friend mm -hmm. um, for, for that support. Um, so the next couple of questions uh, is, so we've got, how do you stay calm when work life is causing stress and home life makes you feel useless due to pain and unable to do anything? Um, and they've said, I feel close to giving up. And I'm really sorry kind of to read that. Um, and then also, how do I manage stress to prevent flare up when my life is so busy? So... I, I share your concern about that person feeling close mm. to giving up. They probably have more internal resources than they realise, but to reach that point, I, I really would suggest the NRAS helpline or Samaritans, but NRAS will know much, much more about the condition that you're grappling with. Um, please try some of the emotional first aid strategies. Again, be kind to yourself. You're having a terrible time. And I think I would want you, if you were my client, to start thinking about why it is that you are um, feeling so useless. Uh, you say causing stress and home life makes you feel useless. Um, I'm wondering if you feel safe enough, if your relationships in the family are safe enough to actually explain that to somebody, tell them how you feel. I mean, I hope that they would respond with, gosh, you know, we couldn't live without you, blah, blah. Um, but it sounds like a conversation that needs to be had. Emma's nodding in mm -hmm. agreement there. Um, and, you know, we're not defined mm -hmm. by what we can achieve at mm -hmm. home. I know we all desperately want to carry on doing things that we've always done. Maybe there are different things you can do, but... Maybe you can't do them in isolation. You have to ask for help or you have to swap um, roles with somebody in the household. Um, but, you know, again, I'd say, how does it feel to say to people, I can't? I'm not good at that. But I do I it. Think <laughs> it is one of the hardest words, isn't it, to say no. Yeah. I think particularly if you've, if you've done something, if that's if that's a way relationships work for years, you know that you've that people have, you know, taken on a certain role, and then to find that that you can't do that anymore, it's really hard, and it's hard to communicate. 
Yeah. Um, and I think we often, you know, we've found when we've done groups that people put set great store by their ability to be the partner they, you know, they were maybe 10 years ago or the, the partner they want to be. And I think that's really hard. Mm. Um, yeah, also totally hard to talk agree. about. Yeah. Very hard. Because I think um, many of us feel a bit diminished somehow. Having ill health mm. is not something people want to hear about all the time. And it can make us feel less than. And um, just going back to um, managing stress and preventing a flare, um, you know, there's a very good e-module on that. And the SMILE uh, e-modules, -mo e um, coping with pain and flares, that really does contain me. I mean, after 42 years, I still read things that I thought, oh, okay, yeah, I should be doing that. I'll give that a go. Don't be Another, defined by what you can achieve and what you can't yeah. achieve. Another th conversation we were having before we started recording was uh, the tendency for people often to put others first, to do every, to use the resources, the energy they have on other people, um, not to prioritize their own well-being. People often find it quite hard to do that, um, but it is a valid thing to do. <laughs> um, to look, to look after, after yourself. You, to look after yeah. yourself, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I always say to clients, you know, it's a bit like a de having a deposit account and a, and not that I've ever had much of a savings account, <laughs> but, you know, a savings account and a, uh, a current account. And you can't keep taking out of the savings account because eventually yeah. it will be depleted. And that's what it's like for us with energy and um, carrying on the way we always did. At some point, we have to allow for change, otherwise we're going to be depleted. Thank you. That's very useful. Um, so the next question we've got is, what's the best way to tell your family you're struggling with your mental health? I would say, firstly, consider why you're needing to ask this question. You know, What's the resistance that you feel about telling them? because your gut instinct is probably pointing you in the right direction. It might be useful if there's somebody external you can talk it through with first. But at the end of the day, you know, these are the people who matter to you and who probably are looking for a way to be let in or to find out more about what you're going through. But, you know, if you're somebody who is always, I'm fine, then how can they? You know, how can you let they won't you won't let them in. So I would say just think about it and do it. Sit them down and say, I need to talk to you. I hope you'll listen. I wonder if sometimes part of this the difficulty as well is as you alluded to, Sarah, sometimes people feel they need to come up with an answer. <laughs> and actually that's probably that's not it. It's about being heard, isn't it? And and having the yeah. opportunity to just, just say what's going on. Absolutely. Because as soon as people find solutions, you feel obliged to take them up. <laughs> yes. And if you can't manage, it's another sort of failure. Mm. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to touch on with kind of the family question is um, I'm from an Asian background. My family's Pakistani. And I know for kind of our community and the culture, you, you know, you just don't talk about mental yeah. health. And it's been, and that's very, very difficult. Um, and similarly about kind of RA um, and kind of talking to your family about your di diagnosis, that's very difficult. Um, we do have a section on our website um, called the Upney Jung section, which um, is great and has stories from uh, South, South Asian pa uh, patients. Um, so that would be really useful for anyone from a South Asian background or similar is kind of struggling with that. Um, I personally find it found it very difficult to tell my family, my parents especially, and talk to them about um, kind of how RA is affecting me and also mental health. Um, I mean, to this day, my parents still don't know the extent of kind of my mental health struggles. Um, and that's very difficult. I think you with kind of parents that are from a different culture, they don't necessarily talk about mental health. It does take time. So I would say um, 
you know uh as long as you try and find other kind of support and loved ones so for me i talk to my siblings a lot um and you know have that conversation with your parents and just keep having it and you know it will might sometimes take time but um as long as you kind of make your feelings clear and kind of the mental space you're in um all they they can do is listen and hopefully accept what you're feeling um but let's move on to the next question. So this next question is um, about JIA. So someone said, how do I help my 12 year old? She started weekly injections after a sudden change in a condition. Her behavior has changed. Um, she's blaming me as I've got JIA. Um, yeah, that's very difficult. She's entitled to be angry, but it's mm. very hard on the mother. Um, mm. I would suggest telling the 12 year old that mum understands because she's been there herself mm -hmm. to really try to open the door to having discussions on a regular basis, give permissions to talk about things, um, tell her that, okay, you know, you understand that she needs to be angry and you can be her punch bag, but she also needs to know that it hurts you. Um, I think also, you know, if there are mood swings, maybe Emma would agree. Um, if it's a biologic, perhaps check that out with your specialist nurse at review or make an, you know, try and make an earlier appointment or something. Because you know, these are strong drugs on forming brains. But it's it's a tough one. Yeah, thank you. That's very useful, Sarah. Um, and you can all, all, always call in the helpline and kind of if you need someone else to talk to, because obviously your daughter's, um, if she's blaming you, that's gonna, going to affect you as well negatively. So it's mm. all really good for you to talk to someone as well. Um, so this next one, um, someone's put in, I'm very anxious. I can't relax around people. Um, I, they don't go outside to see people. Um their husband is a kidney transplant patient and their vaccine hasn't worked for them. So someone kind of feeling a lot of anxiety at the moment, especially with kind of COVID still, um, you know, being uh, relevant for a lot of people and shielding. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, Emma, and I talked about this at some length. Um, it's complicated, isn't it? I mean, I'm presuming that this person has tried their GP and tried to get a perspective on risk at the moment and hopefully, you know, um, their partner's risk. Um, and this business about vaccination not worked. My hunch is that if you were to go on Health Unlocked, you'd encounter a lot of people who've had this problem themselves. And it's a tremendous resource for understanding what has worked for other people. Um, and NS has a web page, of course, on COVID advice. And there's always a wonderful helpline. I'm sorry to sort of bat it away to others, but I don't know enough about the um, you know, the, the medical approach to COVID and and people who are so very immunosuppressed. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> the helpline I would say is just a great resource to kind of talk through your situation because it sounds quite complicated. Um, so our next question, we've got kind of four more to go through, so I'll try and quickly go through them. How do I tell my colleague that his inconsiderable behavior is a constant drain on my mental health, particularly as he has his own mental health issues? If someone's being considerate, I would suggest that in the first instance, um, you explain the impact of their behaviour on you. People don't always do things intentionally, but nonetheless, this is hurting you and you don't need that. And it's not fair in the workplace. Um, if there's no change, I guess the only other thing to do is um, talk to a line manager, HR, um, you just can't change other people's behaviour. They have to want to change it for themselves. But, you know, that's really tough. 
think it's really yeah. sweet that you yeah. care about his mental health health issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um, in a work environment, you obviously that's very draining to be in that situation. Um, hopefully where this person works, they've got some really good resources um, in terms of kind of HR. And um, yeah, I would say definitely you need to deal with it. You can't kind of keep working in that in that way. Um, uh, so our next question, uh, I have a Bipolar diagnosis, oh, I was diagnosed in 1997 and then diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in 1998. How can I get my family and friends to differentiate the two conditions? I'm, I'm just slightly confused. I don't know if that, I hope this person is on the, has joined the webinar and could perhaps send a, a private chat comment or put a, um, a non identifying comment in the other chat because. I'm, I'm trying to understand why you would need your friends to differentiate the two conditions. Presumably they know you as you are. You, you may always have been bipolar, so they're used to that aspect of you. Perhaps it's the rheumatoid that's the new addition. Um, we can't tell. Oh, no, 1998, so it followed the bipolar. Um, yeah, I don't fully understand what is needed here, but I'm sure I can help. I just mm. don't quite understand the question. Yeah, if they get in touch, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and if it's after today, I'd be very happy to uh, to to get send an answer. Thank you, Sarah. I, I mean, I think thinking as as well about some of of the work that's been done. I wonder if part of the issue is around this sort of holistic care, um, being seen as a whole person. Um, yeah. Although, yeah, I'm like you. I'm not quite sure. What, it's almost the question almost suggests the opposite in terms of. Um, attributing different elements of someone's health to different yeah. causes. Um, I'm wondering why they need that differentiation. Yeah. yeah. And unless it's it's a, something very specific, you know, the, the start, you know, the, somebody can be concerned about something specific to the arthritis, for example, you know, around taking a medication or, or a treatment. Mm. Um, it, it, yeah, I wonder maybe it's something... <clears throat> thank you yeah I, th I think um if if they're able to get in touch with us and yeah Sarah mm -hmm. thank you for offering to kind of reach out to them as well mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me um so our next question when do I start taking antidepressants that uh, they're newly diagnosed with RA they've been work uh, off work for almost a year now and have still haven't been stabilized on their medication and pain mm -hmm. That's a, a very hard place to be. Um, if your GP thinks that antidepressants are suitable right now, then presumably you'll try them. Um, but it's not always easy to come off them. And at the moment, life is so uncertain for you. Um, a drug isn't going to change all of that. You need to be able to process what's actually happening. Maybe an antidepressant will allow you to do that. But my caution would be um, that once the pain is under control, you might actually feel very different. And antidepressants do blunt happier feelings as much as they blunt and keep down the sad feelings. So, you know, my hope for you is that you are going to be treated very soon with something that works. I hope that you are pressing as politely and civilly as you can for that um, treatment to happen. Uh, making people aware that you're suffering to this degree um, and then maybe see how you are. Um, but a short course of antidepressants isn't the end of the world. Um, but I would say try to come off them purely because you're in this situation. It's a state of real flux. And if you're on antidepressants, you might not know quite how you'd have dealt without them. And then you might think, I'm going to stay on them forever. Thank you. Um, so our last question, um, well, more of a comment. Uh, please discuss how pain impacts our mental health. And when we go through too much, how, how can it change us? And this person um, has been diagnosed, has been had RA for 40 years, um, 10 replacements, now aged 57. 
and they're very tired and worn out and finding it tough to come to terms with a recent diagnosis of bipolar. Um, I've tried hard to lead a normal life as possible, but fear I've burnt myself out in the process of fighting RA. Oh. It's very, a very sad um, question, comment. Um, mm -hmm. I think, first of all, this person needs to congratulate themselves on coming this far Getting through all of that is no walk in the park, is it? It's uh, it's very, very difficult. And again, you know, before any really useful drugs were around. So I'm imagining, well, yeah, 10, 10 replacements. Um, no wonder you feel tired and worn out. That is absolutely normal. Um, and then to be given another diagnosis on top, you must be absolutely reeling. But actually, you know, You've probably been bipolar for a long time, so this doesn't change anything, except that's how you think people will see you. Do they have to know? That's entirely up to you. Um, but it's the relentless nature of RA that causes anxiety, which tips into really low mood and sometimes depression. And it's a lack of control, a feeling that you know there's this enemy within that you can't do anything about. Actually, you'll find there's lots you can do to stay you, mm. really lots. You need to remind yourself that you are still the person you always were. Even if you're not experienced that way by people around you, you have to know it, you have to remind yourself. And yes, it would have changed you to some degree, but not totally, not totally. And um, I would want to say as well, how would it feel to just give yourself permission to give up. What would happen? My hunch is that after a period of sadness and grieving, somebody like you will be up and at it again because it's in your nature. You're resilient. You sound resilient. You'd have had to be to get this far. Um, so my hunch is my, that you'll recharge your batteries after a period of just letting go giving in, see how that feels instead of fighting the whole time. Mm. I like that, Sarah. That's, you know, we need to remember we can't be fighting all the time. Sometimes it is, you know, we do need to take a back seat and just, just you know, not think about it as much. Um, and I hope this person has the time and space in their lives to do that. Um, yes. Obviously, it can sure. be difficult they have a really busy life if they've got a lot of responsibility but um, I think it is very important because you know it's it's very overwhelming to try and keep on top of things all the time and it just burns you out um, so yeah thank you for that Sarah um, so that's the end of our questions and I know we have run over a little bit so um, uh, we've had quite a few comments in but unfortunately we won't be able to get to them um, but yeah, I'd like to say thank you so much, Emma and Sarah, for your time today. Um, just wanted to mention just a few things before we end. <clears throat> so um, just to say again that NRAS will be at the BSR next week and we'll have a stand there um, and hopefully we'll get a few kind of behind the scenes uh, photos um, from uh, everyone who's there. I believe Claire will be there as well as a few others. Um, and also our stress matters survey results um, should be coming out soon. So if you keep an eye out on that, um, obviously it'll, it's actually stress stress awareness month this month. So um, that's uh, very kind of uh, timely and relevant. Um, again, please check out our uh, e-learning platform, Smile. Um, that's got a lot on there about self-management and can can help a lot with um, flare-ups. And we've also got our upcoming exercise module um, to look out for in the next kind of uh, few months. Um, that'll be really great. Um, we've also got GIA Awareness Week coming up uh, on the 3rd to the 7th of July. And that's all about busting GIA myths. So um, looking at misconceptions and the things people have heard. Um, so also keep an eye out for that. Um, and lastly, just to talk about kind of uh, right start, if you have been newly diagnosed, um, that's kind of a great way to for your 
um, rheumatologist to refer you to NRAS um, and also JIA Right Start, which we've had um, incredible results from so far um, that only launched um, very recently. And we'll be going into the next phase uh, of that as well. Um, yes, thank you so much, Emma and Sarah. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we end? Uh, just really touched by so many of the comments that I've seen coming through. Um, I think it's just mind blowing to see that people want to talk about this stuff. And um, I think we've got a lot to thank Emma for because if this does translate, if her work translates into more services for patients, it would help so much. And I was just going to say, I haven't been able to read all the comments, but from what I've been able to see that the sort of thing that's shining through is, is the support and the social support um, and the benefits of people sharing their experiences and also their ideas and their, you know, sort of um, thoughts around how to deal with things. And it's always wonderful and inspirational to hear you, Sarah. Oh, thank you, Emma. That's really <laughs> kind. Really kind. I think it's inspirational to read the comments from all these people who live with something that uh, we can't change a huge amount about, but we can do something. And that's what we need to hang on to. Yes, thank you so much, both of you. And good luck for your talk as well next week, Emma. Yeah, thank you. You're amazing. Um, but yeah, I hope you all ha have a lovely evening. And thank you for everyone who uh, tuned in and watched today. Um, this will be recorded so you can watch back if you'd like. Um, and also do reach out uh, and let us know if you'd like uh, the tips from Sarah as well. We can send that out. Um, okay, hope everyone has a lovely Wednesday evening. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks, Anita. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.